down at our core, I feel like there's so much universality to to being human. And that to me yeah. has always been fascinating. And I feel like that drives so much of our motivation and our success and our connection with each other when we're talking about leadership or teamwork. So it's just always been a part of who I am. And, and then as I got a little bit older and started to understand it more, it became a part of my work because I realized, oh, we can't really build confidence or build trust or connection mm -hmm. with other humans if we're not willing to be real. Welcome to Stuck to Unstoppable, where we interview the world's foremost thought leaders to break things down in order to help you get past your hurts, habits, and hangups, and finally level up and move forward. I'm your host, Steven Scoggins. Now let's go ahead and get into today's guest and our featured conversation. You're not going to want to miss it. My special guest today has thrown thousands of pitches until an arm injury ended his professional sports career. But as a true overcomer, he began to dissect what it actually takes to predictably scale any business or team for ultra performance and has now logged thousands of miles as an expert in leadership and team performance and company cultures that deliver keynotes and seminars all over the world to empower leaders, teams, and organizations to be crazy successful. Mike Robbins is the author of five books, included his most recent bestseller, We're All In This Together. His talents have led him to work with some of the world's most powerful brands, such as Google, Wells Fargo, eBay, Gap, Microsoft, Schwab, Airbnb, the Oakland A's, Harvard University, Coca-Cola, Oprah News Radio. Dude, seriously, Jazz, just to name a few. Guys, help me welcome my good friend, Mike Robbins. Dude, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm good, Stephen. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely, dude. I've actually uh, been looking forward to the interview for some time. I've been, um, I've been, uh, I guess, a cyber stalking is probably the best way to do it. But I've, <laughs> I stumbled across that uh, that you, the uh, TEDx talk that you did uh, back in 2015 that literally sparked interest. And I remember it kind of like almost going on this viral kind of scenario when I first saw it. Then uh, with my friends over at Entree Leadership who recommended that I take a look at it. You know, so now we're full circle. You've had multiple best-selling books. You've got a whole bunch of cool stuff happening. You've traveled thousands of miles, opened up lots of doors, inspired many, many crowds, you know, so I want to make sure that the audience gets the full weight of everything that you've discovered and learned and transitioned. But I always like to start off with the origin story because I think a lot of people forget that every start is not the end. So tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into what you got. Yeah, well, I've been doing this for 20 years now, which still kind of blows my mind. It feels like it was, you know, just a, a few weeks ago that I started. But I mean, basically, you know, I, I grew up here, Stephen, in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I, I still live now. I grew up in Oakland and I was a baseball player growing up. That's what I loved. That's what I was super passionate about. I was pretty good at it. I actually got drafted out of high school by the New York Yankees. Um, I didn't end yeah, up that, signing. That major pretty well, you know. I think I was, I'm all right, but I didn't end up signing with the Yankees though at that time because I got an opportunity to play baseball in college at Stanford. So I went to Stanford, I played baseball there. Then I got drafted out of Stanford by the Kansas City Royals and I signed a pro contract. And the way it works in baseball, most, most of the people listening to us watching us now probably know, you know, you get drafted by a major league team, whether it's the Yankees or the Royals or the Dodgers or the Cubs or whoever, you got to go into the minor league. So I go into the minors with Kansas City. I was a pitcher working my way up, trying to get to the big leagues. Unfortunately for me, my third season still in the minors, I went out to pitch one night. I threw one pitch. I tore ligaments mm -hmm. in my elbow. I was actually, at the yeah. time, I was playing for the for the Wilmington Blue Rocks in the Carolina League, and we were playing against the Durham Bulls, which I know is not that far oh, from God. where you are, right? Um, so I hurt my arm against the Durham Bulls. This was 1997. They sent me back to California. I had an operation on my arm. I ended up having two more operations over the next three years. I did everything I could because to come back because I love playing baseball, but I wasn't able to make it back and was forced to retire from baseball when I was 25 years old. I had started when I was seven. So oh, now man. I'm like, you know, 18 of the first 25 years of my life is this one thing that I'm good at. That's my whole world, my whole identity. Like, what the heck am I going to do now? I mean, I, you know, I'd gone to college and gotten a degree, but didn't really know. Um, so it was the late nineties. I get a job working in the tech world out here in the Bay area, you know, in sales, mm -hmm. online ad sales. And it was interesting, but I wasn't that passionate about it. But what I've noticed, cause as an athlete, what I've been fascinated by, in addition to, I love the game. I was fascinated by the idea that it wasn't always the most talented people that were the most successful. Oh, and okay. it also, it also wasn't always the most successful people that were the most, you know, the happiest and most fulfilled. So I was like, okay, so there's something there 
And then on the team side of things, it wasn't always the teams that had the best players that were necessarily the best teams. I mean, you needed to have some good talent, but there was that thing we call chemistry in sports. And so I was really interested in all these, what I would now call sort of intangible aspects of success and fulfillment individually, and then also team-wise. Mm -hmm. But, and then I started to, I got really interested in personal growth and development for myself, like trying to heal mentally, emotionally, not only physically from this big life transition, trying to figure out what the heck am I going to do next? And yeah. I immediately started reading lots of books that were inspiring to me, you know, following authors like Deepak Chopra or Wayne Dyer yeah. or Richard Carlson or Dan Millman or Tony Robbins. And I was like, I was loving that stuff personally. And I had this kind of secret fantasy in the back of my mind, Stephen, maybe one day, if I ever can like figure out whatever the heck I'm doing with the next phase <laughs> of my life, maybe eventually I could do that. And then the yeah. universe kind of intervened and I lost my job in 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst and I was out of work. And then I just decided, you know what, even though I'm young and I'm scared and I don't really know how to do this, I'm going to try to start my business. And there was no Twitter or Instagram yeah. or podcasts at the time. It was just like, how am I going to get out writing and speaking and coaching? But that was the desire back then 20 years ago. And I got a lot of help and support, but I was able to get myself into the coaching world and then ultimately into the speaking world and the writing world. And, you know, 20 years later, I'm here talking to you, which uh, it's been quite a journey. <laughs> That's awesome. And you even have a nice haircut to go with it. That's what I'm saying. Hey, you know, I love it, man. Nice and easy, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, look, is, is it when you started working through the identity struggles of obviously a, a career that you thought was going to be, and started, you know, kind of pivoting. What was yeah. that journey? What was that particular journey like? Because I find that identity isn't really discovered until you're later in life, even though people think they're one thing. A lot of times they discover something more. Yeah, it was hard. I mean, it was really hard because, you know, growing up as a kid, I mean, you know, I started playing baseball at seven. I was good at it. And I started getting attention for it. And I, you know, single mom, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, life wasn't easy. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I had this like horrible childhood, but it was challenging and stressful. But baseball was the thing that was always like, oh, that's my thing. That's, that's what, you know, and I thought as a kid and then as an adolescent and then as a young man, this was the thing that made me special, made me unique, made me, you know. Um, and so to have that go away, it was the disappointment of the dream, my own personal ambition and goal and all, all that I'd worked for. But it was also like people related to me, like I was Mike, the baseball player. So now it was like, well, who the heck am I if I'm not that? And and what am I going to do without that? So, you know, it's not that common that someone at the age of 25, like me, has spent 18 of those first 25 years doing something. But I think a lot of us can relate to identifying with what we do and then at some point along the way, having a setback or a real challenge that knocks us to the ground and we go, oh, wait a minute, maybe I'm more than whatever that thing is. And so that was the yeah. process I had to go through was clearly baseball's now not in the cards for me anymore, but that does not define who I am. Now it's time for mm -hmm. me to figure out who I really am if I'm not mm -hmm. just a baseball player. Is that how you stumbled your way into, you know, something that I mentioned just briefly as we were kind of kicking off and getting started and something I've, 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 I've discovered by watching a ton of your content is this spirit of authenticity, the importance of being authentic to one's core. You know, I have a, a terminology we use within my organization called the seven enemies of identity. And one of those enemies of identity is not being authentic to yourself. Yeah. Is that how you discovered the, the importance of authenticity? Well, yes. And it was kind of a journey for me, Stephen. You know, it was like I was this, I mean, it started early where I was always this really sensitive, emotional kid. And you and I both know, you know, you're probably a few years younger than me, but like as boys and as men, like we get trained in this way, like suck it up, be a man, especially in sports. And, you know, and I was raised by a single mom with an older sister and, and I was just wired in a certain way. And, I, and, and the way it manifested itself was like, and I was a good athlete, right? I was good, but I would look around at my teammates and this was true not just in sports but even in school and i did pretty well in school too but it was like i had all of these thoughts and feelings and doubts and fears and insecurities running inside of me and nobody was talking about those things right so i thought well maybe i'm just weird like maybe i'm just crazy like maybe something's wrong with me and i actually do come from a family where there's a lot of mental illness my dad suffered from bipolar disorder so i thought well maybe you know i've got some of that i didn't know what the heck was going on 
But as I started to get a little bit older, this was long before I even started writing and speaking and talking about authenticity as like a topic or a thing. I just found mm -hmm. myself really drawn to people who would tell the truth about their own experience. Because whenever I heard someone else who got real about something, mm -hmm. even if I didn't necessarily agree with them or couldn't relate, it always made me feel safer. It always, like one of my favorite days of the baseball season, as weird as this sounds, and I've written about this over the years, was the last day of the season. And usually on the last day, if you won the championship, it was awesome because you won and you got to celebrate. And I love that, don't get me wrong, but more often you lost. The last game was a loss that you got eliminated from yep. the playoffs or whatever, right? And as much as that sucked and I didn't like it, like the competitor in me, what I appreciated was some of the guys would cry. And it was like the one day of the year that the sort of boys don't cry rule went out the window and nobody made fun of each other. It's like guys would sit in their lockers with their glove over their face. It was like a very private thing. But you were allowed to show your emotion. And, yeah. and, I, and I liked it. Even like the biggest, toughest, strongest guy on the team who I was kind of scared of, I'd look over and he'd be crying too. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'm not so crazy. So that's a long way around to answer your question that I've always just been drawn to this. There's this deeper truth that runs within us, I believe. And even though we're all different and unique and we have different perspectives and values and backgrounds and down at our core, I feel like there's so much universality to, to being human. And that to me yeah. has always been fascinating. And I feel like that drives so much of our motivation and our success and our connection with each other when we're talking about leadership or teamwork. So it's just always been a part of who I am. And, and then as I got a little bit older and started to understand it more, it became a part of my work because I realized, oh, we can't really build confidence or build trust or connection mm -hmm. with other humans if we're not willing to be real. Yeah, I mean, I, I stumbled across one of your quotes and, and I'm going to botch it up so you can clarify for us. But essentially, you said, why be somebody else when you're, when you're, well, I don't know, I'm sorry. Why be anything <laughs> other than yourself when somebody else has already taken? Something, something along those lines. I just right. thought it was brilliant. I just thought it was brilliant. It's, well, yeah, I appreciate it. It's, it's actually, so it's the title of one of my books is Be Yourself, Everyone Else Has Already Taken, already. which is actually a, a, a great quote from Oscar Wilde that I found when I was writing my first book back way back in 2006. My first book, Focus on the Good Stuff, came out in 07. I was Googling when I'd get stuck writing with my first book. I didn't really know what the heck to write about or how to write. I was sort of making it up as I go, which I still kind of do, by the way. But anyway, but I would Google. I, right, I would Google stuff as I was writing, right? Just like trying to find inspiration, trying to find quotes. And I found this great quote from Oscar Wilde that said, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. And when I was working on my book, my second book on authenticity, the, the working title was, because my first book had been focused on the good stuff. The working title of the second book was focus on the real stuff. But then mm -hmm. I used that quote with my editor, the Oscar Wilde quote, and he was like, oh, that's the title. And I was like, really? Can I use it? Someone else's anyway. But so that quote to me is so, <laughs> is so important, though. And I, I got, I've, over the years, I've gotten every now and again, I'll get an angry email from someone. You wrote a book on authenticity and you stole someone else's quote for the title. And I was like, if you read the introduction, I actually acknowledge Oscar Wilde within the first couple of paragraphs. But that's beside the point. But I think, again, the message is ultimately that we spend a lot of time, understandably, in our culture trying to, you know, emulate and at times imitate others, which is not a bad thing to do, especially when we're first learning something or first developing. I mean, we all do that with our parents. We do that with our teachers, our coaches, you know, but at some point, and it's tricky because, you know, the world is, is such that I see people that I respect and admire and think, oh, I want to be like him or like her or like that, which is great, but I got to do it my own way because I can't yeah. be like you and I can't be like anybody else. I can only really be like yeah. me. And the more, as, as corny as it sounds, the more we can get that and really embody that and celebrate that, the more freedom we have and the more power we can ultimately have. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, you know, I, there, there's the absolute truth to the quote for sure. No matter whether, whether or not Oscar Wilde said it first or used it on the book cover <laughs> or whatever, it still doesn't erase the truth. I mean, I think about all the times that I was most frustrated and most fearful, most concerned most anxiety ridden, uh, most prone to sorrow or despair or whatever, I was trying to fit myself into a mold that wasn't created for me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, and I feel like that the subject of authenticity is so underrated, right? You got yourself and a handful of other professional speakers that have really done the research, really taken the time to really study it, um, that have done and 
everybody's best effort to make it more of a uh, more of a life truth kind of thing, you know, yeah. that I, I find that it still needs to be said over and over and over and over again. You know, I look at um, children, for example, they grow up, they have a natural gift to paint, they have a natural gift to play sports, they got a natural gift to do all kinds of things, but yet they end up going into college or end up going into school or something like that to do something totally polar opposite because mom and dad right. wanted them to do it. Yeah. Or mom and dad said your life should look like this or look like that. Yeah. You know, and so when you when you look at authenticity as a whole, what does authenticity really mean to us as a community and us as individuals? Well, uh, two things. I mean, I, I do think, you know, with respect to children and, you know, our, our girls are now 14 and 12 and watching them develop over the years has been fascinating just to see how we're born with this natural authenticity. And sadly, the world tends to train it out of us to a lot of to to a certain degree. So we have to be mindful of that. But to your question in terms of what it means, the way I define authenticity is that authenticity is honesty without self-righteousness and with Mm. vulnerability. So I sometimes even talk about it as an equation. It's honesty minus self-righteousness and plus vulnerability. Self-righteousness is the I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. And look, we all fall into that, whether it's, you know, with so many things, and there's nothing wrong with having strong opinions, there's nothing wrong with speaking up, but there's a difference between self righteousness, which is I'm right, and anyone agrees with me is wrong or an idiot, versus conviction, which is I believe this to be true, I'm willing to speak up about it. But I have enough humility, enough self awareness to realize I might be wrong, which we're all wrong, often, actually, or at the very least, maybe there's other ways to look at this thing that I can't currently see. So we got to be able to remove our self-righteousness and then add vulnerability. And vulnerability is really about embracing risk, emotional exposure, and uncertainty. And those things, we've we've all been taught that vulnerability is weakness or we shouldn't be vulnerable or protect your vulnerabilities or all these things. But in reality, if we're going to be successful, if we're going to take risks and create anything extraordinary, if we're going to build trust with other human beings, we got to be able to embrace uncertainty. We got to be able yeah. to take some risks and we got to be able to be somewhat emotionally exposed. I mean, again, just think of this whole year as we've been going through COVID. It's a collective time of uncertainty and vulnerability. So yeah. many things have changed and and have been forced to change. Many of us are fortunate enough to still be healthy and still be able to do our work and still, right? But yeah. so many others have not been nearly as lucky and all of us, I don't know, a single person on the planet who has not been significantly impacted by this. And this was not what we planned at the start of 2020, but it's what got dealt to all of us. And then it's just a matter of how do we adjust and pivot to that and continue yeah. to do so until we find ourselves on the other side of it. And we're getting closer ever so slightly. Yes, I know. Well, each each day we're we're closer to the other side of this, whatever that means and whenever that is, right? <laughs> right. Well, look, you know, so authenticity is um, it's one one attribute of what I refer to as the self awareness axis. Yep. The other one is another concept that I think that you brilliantly articulate, and that's the concept of wholeness and how authenticity over time breeds wholeness and why wholeness is so important. Yeah. Because I find a lot of people try to segment themselves. Well, I'm a I'm the business guy. I'm the sports guy. I'm the I'm a this, I'm a that, not realizing that everything blends together. Right. How did you discover the the importance of wholeness and how have you been able to use it to not just shape your own life, but shape the lives of you know thousands of other people you've had the pleasure of talking to? Well, I th- it's a great question. I mean, I think that, you know, one, one of another book that I wrote is called Bring Your Whole Self to Work, because the truth of the matter is, look, it's not that everything that we bring forth um, is effective necessarily, right? It's like, I've got strengths and I've got, you know, liabilities and things that aren't as strong, but the freedom to, to fully, you know, bring all of myself to integrate it. That means that what's valuable again, look, we all have certain skills. So on a team, it's like, if someone's really good at sales, have that person be the salesperson. If someone's really good at the technical stuff, have them be focused on the technical stuff. But that means in those roles, just as an example, you can also bring your whole self and there's a certain importance to that wholeness. Um, You know, again, on a a sports team, it's like I was a pitcher in baseball. I wasn't also a catcher and a center fielder and a third baseman, right? I mean, you know, I played other positions when I was growing up as a kid, but it's okay to specialize in certain things, but that doesn't mean we have to limit ourselves. One of the things to your question that's really important, like I do a lot of work with 
big companies, big Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. I do a lot of work with yeah. leadership teams. And when I'm working with particularly like a senior leadership team or an executive leadership team, and you have people sitting at the table, you have the CEO and you have the head, you know, the CFO, and you've got the chief people officer, and you've got the head of product, and you've got the head of sales and, you know, engineering and all the, I'm sorry, all, so all the of C them. You've got the the every, CFO, CEO, exactly. COO, CEO. <laughs> But the thing that's really important that I often will say to those teams is like, look, there's a difference between a team of leaders and a leadership mm -hmm. team because a yeah. team of leaders all sits there and it's like, I'm, I'm head of sales. I'm, and of course, those roles are really stressful and they've got a lot of pressure. And oftentimes, like I could talk to the head of product at a technology company and he or she could have thousands of people in their organization to report to them. But when they sit at that table, they are both advocating for the team that they manage and their area of expertise but they're also an executive in that company that doesn't mean they don't have a thought or an idea about something related to legal or something related to sales or, you know what I mean? And so that's true also, again, just in life in general. And that doesn't mean we should be stepping on people's toes and telling everyone what to do, but that sense of, to your question of wholeness, like there's a lot to me that isn't just about the specific things that I might be quote yep. unquote an expert in. And so again, the yep. more freedom that we have to bring some of that, you were talking earlier about kids who, paint or whatever it's like having these gifts and talents or interests or right like we're all yeah. complex human beings with lots of different interests and i think creating environments whether it's at home or at work where we can express some of that benefits all of us for sure you know when you start looking at the concepts of authenticity and um, you start looking at the concepts of conflict resolution you start looking at the approach of wholeness yeah i find that people who are self-aware in their authentic self people who are self-aware in their strengths and struggles and blind spots people who are self-aware in the areas of wholeness tend to be a whole lot more emotionally quasi intelligent if you will so mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about the importance of how those things play in emotional intelligence because you just mentioned it so you got a team of leaders versus a leadership team yeah a lot of times from what i've seen at least as an experience as being an entrepreneur for over 20 plus years and having a leadership team of my own it made me even think to myself okay do i have a team of leaders or i got a leadership team? all right team, <laughs> leadership team okay good right you know, but what I've seen and, I, and I've experienced it and done this wrong myself before is uh, ego kind of slips into the way, you know, yeah. and as a result, the authenticity goes out the window, the wholeness goes out the window, the, the intention of connection goes out the window. How does, how yeah. does, how do these subjects, all these different parts and pieces play into an emotionally healthy individual that then plays into a team? Well, look, it's complicated because we're, we're complex human beings and we have, well, we all yeah. have egos, we all have blind spots. Um, and, and, and in business, a lot of the times, and as an entrepreneur, as a leader, we're, we're driving to certain outcomes, right? I yeah. mean, and again, things happen, you know, a, a recession hits, a pandemic hits, and all of a sudden it's like, I could love everybody I'm working with and on the team and right. And at the end of the day, we're running a business. So we yeah. have to make hard decisions sometimes. That said, to your point, emotional intelligence is about self-awareness and self-management first and foremost. And then it's about social awareness and relationship management. And it's a lifelong ongoing process for us to continue to deepen our awareness of ourselves. And it sounds like, I mean, this is the work that you do and you know this, right? So I'm yeah. preaching to the choir here, but it's like, I'm the every single day of my life from now until whenever I'm no longer walking around on the planet, I have an opportunity to learn more about myself and to continue to deepen my ability to manage how I make my way through the world. I can also yeah. continue to pay more attention to the people around me and yeah. to people in general and learn more deeply how to interact. I mean, again, just think about as using a simple example of just Zoom right? You and I are talking on Zoom right now. If you'd have asked me a year ago or five years ago about Zoom, like mm -hmm. first I would be like, what the hell is Zoom? And then is that like Skype, I guess, you know, but the point is, but it's like figuring out how do we communicate with people on a platform like this, where it's more yep. two dimensional as opposed to three dimensional. I can't, I can see you, but I can't really feel you. It's not like sitting in the yep. same room, but it's a little better than talking on the phone, but it's become this thing where like, I'm now just, I'm sure like you are leading meetings on zoom or speaking to people, large groups of people on zoom, which yep. is 20 years of doing this. And I'm, yep. you know, in the, in March and April, I was terrible at it because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> we even where to look or how to interact. Hey, 
I'm yeah. used to people. I can't even feel you. Yeah. Right. But, but I realized that, I mean, just for me, just you, like what I do for a living where I'm up on stage speaking to groups of people, or sometimes I'm with a small group of people sitting around a table or whatever, but often yeah. feeding off the energy of the group. And then when that was taken away, it's like, oh, okay. I've it's so I'm using that as an example, like having to learn how to tap more into self-awareness, self-management. What do I need to do to show up? And then social awareness, relationship management. How do I connect with people even though I can't see them? I don't know exactly what's happening. And again, for all of us, whatever, not everybody's out giving motivational speeches, but as human beings interacting in the world using this platform, we've had to ironically use our emotional intelligence in order to be able to navigate through the technological ability to, I mean, how amazing is it that we have this technology? I say to people all the time, yeah. if this were 15, 20, 50, a hundred years ago, I don't know what the heck we'd do. Most of us would just be sitting at home yeah. writing each other letters. You know what I mean? Like, so, but that's, would be. yeah. I mean, and, and, you yeah. know, and there was a pandemic that, that impacted the world a hundred years ago in a pretty catastrophic yeah. way. And people did not have the ability to even use the telephone, yeah. let alone zoom as much as we might have zoom fatigue and it gets annoying. It's like, it's pretty cool that we can do it. So anyway, the, to your question, I think though, continuing, this is one of the things I see individuals, leaders and teams struggle with, especially in the entrepreneurial cycle. And when we're really working hard to grow something or build something, we get so caught up in the tactical execution aspects of it, which we need to, of course. We forget mm -hmm. though, to continue to develop a lot of those softer skills. But as I've said yeah. for years, soft skills are hard. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely hard to create. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, actually, it's not funny. It's it's impactful. I ran across a story that you told uh, at one of your events where uh, at a very touching moment, your daughter was having a hard time understanding how you had not moved away from or moved on with baseball specifically. Mm -hmm. And I, if you're all with it, I'd love, I'd love to invite you to kind of share that story because I think there's a beautiful lesson in it. Um, yeah. Not only a teachable moment between you and your daughter, but I think there's a, a, a vast amount of learning lessons in that in that moment for us all, even yeah. to now, because yeah. 2020 did, did not meet our expectations. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah. So I was so Samantha, my older daughter, who's 14 now, she's a freshman in high school. She and I were in the car 10 years ago. She was four at the time. Her uh, younger sister, Rosie, was about a year and a half and was home with Michelle, my wife. And we were driving, just me and Samantha, we were driving to a baseball game, actually a college baseball game in Berkeley. We were going to see Cal and Stanford play. And Samantha, little four-year-old Samantha in her booster seat in the back of the car says to me, hey, daddy, hey, daddy, are you going to play in the game? And I, because she knew that I'd played baseball and then I'd go, no, honey, daddy's not going to play. Well, why not? And I said, well, honey, you know, daddy doesn't play baseball. Well, well why not? You know, when they're three, four, they all ask a lot of why, why not questions, right? And I said, well, well, honey, and I thought she knew, or maybe she'd forgot. I don't know, but I, well, you know, daddy hurt his arm and I had surgery. I explained that first she's a little scared, then she's a little confused. And eventually she gets it. Oh, I get it, daddy. I mean, you can't play baseball anymore. And then she asked me, Stephen, she asked me a simple question, but one I wasn't quite prepared for. She said, daddy, are you sad about that? Mm -hmm. And I paused for a moment when she asked, because I was like, you know, I wasn't expecting my four-year-old to ask me about my emotional well-being, but I, I appreciated the question. And I paused and took a breath and I said, no, honey, you know, I'm not sad. I said, I was sad when it happened. I was really sad. It was a big deal. I said, but that was a long time ago. I'm not sad about it anymore. I said, in fact, you know what, honey, I'm grateful. And she said, mm. grateful, grateful. Because even at four years old, she knew what grateful meant. We talk about gratitude a lot at home. She said, why are you grateful, daddy, that you hurt your arm and you can't play baseball anymore? And I said, well, honey, if daddy never hurt his arm, I never would have met mommy. Mm and I wouldn't be your daddy. Mm. And then I literally burst into tears and she was like, daddy, are you okay? And I was like, and I, it's never happened in a moment. I, I was shocked at how emotional I got. And I was like, yeah, honey, I'm yeah. fine. I'm fine. Like, whoa, like I, I was surprised yeah. that it really hit me in the heart. And I have no idea if my four-year-old Samantha got it in that moment, but I know that I got it at a whole deeper level. Look, the issue isn't yeah whether it's 2020 and the pandemic and every or anything, the issue isn't whether we're going to have setbacks or challenges or get stuck. Like that happens. Yeah. Like every successful person that any of us know or hear about, it's not like a straight line up to the success. There's a lot of bumps. Look, and some of us, some of us are more fortunate to start at a better place than others. Let's be honest. But along the way, everybody falls down. And the issue is, can I get back up? 
And am I willing to get back up? Am I willing to learn from the experience as opposed to feel sorry for myself or stay stuck in that? Look, I mean, there's a legitimate story that most of us could have about how unfair what's happened this year has been to so many of us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, it's like, okay. And I'm not, I'm not discounting the impact of all that what's happened, but the reality yeah. is, and look in some situations, I mean, again, if you're running a company that is in the entertainment world or in the gathering people together <laughs> space, that's kind of a hard business to be in, right? If you're in a business <laughs> that serves people who are sitting at home in front of their computers or whatever, like, okay, do you know what I mean? So yeah. look, there are definitely some haves and have nots in this experience, but ultimately like everything in life, we get to choose how we engage with it. And, and I had a yeah. therapist years ago, Stephen, say to me this great thing. She said, Mike, don't waste a good crisis, which I thought was kind of insensitive at the time when she said it to me, because I was going through a really tough time. And she's like, <laughs> here's what I know. She goes, here's what I know from years of being a therapist. You will get through this difficult stretch that you're, I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know exactly what's involved, but I know you will get to the other side. What I don't know is how you're going to be on the other side. And that's not up to me as your therapist. That's up to you. If you utilize this challenging time in your life to learn, to grow, to change, to evolve, to, I don't know, you will be better yeah. and stronger on the other side. If you simply just focus on surviving this thing, that's all you're going to mm -hmm. do. And it was a little bit of tough love, but I tell you what, I really appreciate her saying that. And that was true then. And it's true now. And I think about it whenever I'm going through something big or small, that's difficult. It's like, okay, I'm not going to waste this crisis because it's here for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, all of that is life truths. You yeah. know, the moment with your daughter, the, the, the self-awareness that pops in your mind, it, you, I think we're, we would be surprised at some of the wisdom that comes out of us when we are being authentic and transparent and vulnerable, yeah. like that moment with your daughter. I think yep. that also sets the tone for today's environment where uh, you and I both share this belief that um, everything that you have to go through is, is really meant to build you up, not tear you down. You kind of right. look at everything as like a brick, yeah. right? You can look at a brick by itself and you can build a foundation or you can bust a window. Totally. You know, that kind of scenario. so totally on that, you know, this, this world has been a little nuts for, for 2020. Sure. I hope we close it out strong, but it's, it's, it's been uh, interesting to say the least. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, you released a brand new book, smack dab in the middle of all this, yeah. right? Called We're All in This Together, which I think is a, is a great term, yeah. right? It's, it's a book, that, by the way, I'm still waiting on Amazon for. So if you got any people there that you want to like, you know, <laughs> call or something like that. Sorry about like that. To get my copy. Yeah. Um, but one of these things that, I, that I've picked up from it is the, the four pillars, hmm. the four pillars. I'd like you to talk about the four pillars and, and how we can use that in today's post-COVID world, hopefully healing world. Right. Um, you know, Nate is vastly separated and all that kind of yeah. stuff. How can we use those to pull everything back together and become more in our own lives? Well, you know, what's interesting about the book. So I finished writing the book in 2019, not knowing it was going to come out in the middle of the pandemic and everything happening. It came out this spring. I did very purposefully, though, want it to come out in 2020 because I figured this was going to be a tumultuous year. And with all the division, yeah. the book is really about creating a team culture of high performance, of trust, of belonging, a lot of the work that I do with teams. But secondarily, it's more about how we find common ground with each other, yeah. even and especially when we're different or things are challenging. Now, that said, I mean, the four pillars, the first one is about psychological safety, which has so much to do with authenticity meaning like mm -hmm. any group, any team, any organization, any community that we're a part of, can we create an environment where people feel safe enough to show up and be themselves? Yep. The second pillar is related to that, which is about focusing on inclusion and belonging, like mm -hmm. really making sure that we do anything and everything we can so that people are included. And ultimately, you know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, it goes from physiological needs to safety needs to belonging needs is the third level before we go to esteem and self-actualization. So the need to belong is a fundamental human need that we all have. And sometimes, yeah. sadly, we end up wanting to belong in opposition to others, which is the lowest level yeah. of belonging, right? Oh, I belong to this group and we're against that other group. Or, you know, I mean, even like in sports, we love sports. It's like, I put on my Yankees jersey and you put on your Red Sox jersey and we yell at each other. But we all kind of know at the end of the day, it's just a game. Like, 
we're not really, yeah. you know what I mean? We're just wearing different shirts. We're not really different people. <laughs> But that's something that sadly, and, and we have to be mindful of this in our country and our world right now, there's so much separation and disconnection in us versus them. I mean, look, I've always been, Stephen, again, I don't mean to sound either holier than now or, or corny about it, mm -hmm. but like always have struggled with this notion of who's the them. So again, so much of what the book is about in the pillars, it's about that us-ness, if you will. And the, the, the third, the third yeah. pillar is about embracing what I call sweaty palm conversations, which are those hard to talk about things, right? Yeah. The, the, the conflicts, the feedback, the differences of opinion, yeah. the elephants in the room and being able to engage, not to prove our, my point and that I'm right and you're wrong necessarily, but to be able to actually talk about things. Because as, you know, as we all know, bad news doesn't age well and we often avoid it yeah. to our own detriment. And then the fourth, the fourth pillar is about caring about and challenging people at yeah. the same time. And I had a, well, I actually on my own podcast, I had one of my coaches from Stanford was on a few, uh, about a year ago. He since is retired. And he said this great thing, Stephen, that really epitomizes this pillar and so much of my work. He said, my, my philosophy for coaching was always simple. I got to love you hard so I can push you hard. Mm. And I said, what do you mean? Yeah. He said, I knew that if I was going to push you and get the most out of you, you as an individual, you as an athlete, your team, the guys you played with, all the guys I coached, and he coached at Stanford for 37 years. He said, I knew the first thing I had to do was make sure that I established that I loved and cared about you as humans. Once you knew that, then I could push you as hard as I needed to push you to get the most yeah. out of you. And, and I think yeah. that's true for a leader, whether it's a sports coach or a business leader. I think that's true for teams and groups. If we push each other, but first and foremost, we care about each other and we do both of those things, then people can really thrive. Yeah, I mean, it's a great tug of war. It's, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy to achieve, but it's definitely worth the effort. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a, we have a, you know, in the organizations that I own, I got six now total with about probably 450 team members across three states. Wow. And to take my heart and scale it into my leaders and my leaders scale it into them and then my leader, you know, this, so on and so forth. It's been tricky. Yeah. You know, cause you have that, that cup approach where you speak into one thing thing. And by the time you get you know, <laughs> a year down the road, it's like, he, yeah, he said this. I'm like, no, here's the video of what we said right, right. right here kind of scenario. And it's, it's always, it, I've, I've found as a leader and as an owner of you know, multiple businesses that the most difficult thing I struggle with is what's the truth. Yeah. You know, because you're, you're trying to balance is this person. So we have this principle here um, that I would rather have a team member come to us and say, hey, look, I've got this going on in my life because we believe in wholeness and authenticity as well. Right. I've got this one in my life. I'm really struggling with it. I don't want to lose my job, but I don't want to harm the company in the process. Yeah. Anytime a team member has come to us and said, this is what's going on. And we've had people go through deaths. We've had people go through COVID. We've had people go through, um, you know, divorces and all kinds of things that, I mean, no offense, but you're not going to be your best when you're going through certain circumstances, period. No, right. No. And so we've always had this principle that we've adopted. Um, I think uh, my, one of my friends uh, over at the Ramsey organization, Dave Ramsey's company, um, yeah. uh, shared this with me a long time ago. We've had this thing where you come to us and say, hey, this is what's going on right? We'll go to you and say, okay, great. Hey, team, team over here for just a minute. Whistle, come on over here. All right, here's the deal. See, John, John's been really awesome with the company. John's got some stuff going on right now. And we're going to, cause we're going to surround John right now while he goes through this and we're going to walk with him through it. Now, if John yeah. wants to tell you what's going on, it's, that's up to John. But for the time being, for the next 30 to 90 days, we're all going to rally around John, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Woo. Right. Awesome. Because we've created that environment, we started to see this, this safety environment, yeah. right? Yeah. Where typically in a typical hierarchy of most companies, as you know, most people don't want to share this with the CEO or the president, the vice president, something bad that happened, right? right? And they're like, well, I'm scared of my job, right? Because of that, we actually have people at every single level of the organization who step up and very, very easily say, hey, look, this thing over here is broken and it can be better. Yeah. Really? We hadn't thought about that because yeah. it's not your viewpoint. Right. Right. So that's beautiful. That this, yeah. I mean, this presence of psychology of safety is a real, real thing. Oh, absolutely. Well, just, I love that you do that. I'm sorry. Thanks for sharing that. Cause that's such a, it's such an important thing. It sounds like for your team, it sounds like yeah. 
the Ramsey organization. By the way, we love Dave Ramsey at our house. We, you know, we, we refer to him as I'm sure many people to Uncle Dave, because he saved our marriage and our life many years ago when we first couldn't figure out how, to, how the heck to get ourselves, uh, you know, financially sober. But um, you're national speaking of it, I'll introduce you to him. Oh, he's great. He's great. Well, but I, but the idea though, too, when you think about that for his organization, for yours, for your team, if you can create an environment where people feel safe enough, they can come forward to let you know when they're having a hard time. Look, I mean, this is one of the tricky things as a business owner and a business leader. On the one hand, your job isn't to solve everybody's problems or to, you know, have everyone have therapy sessions. Yet at the same time, to your point, you can't expect people. I mean, look right now, a lot of what I do when I'm talking to leaders at Google or Wells Fargo or, you know, Microsoft or these other big companies, it's like, when I talk to them, they're saying, the people on my team are really struggling because their kids are home, you know, doing online school, or they've got a family member who lost their job, or, you know, their parent got COVID or whatever it is. And those are like, those are real life things that if we don't feel like we can't share that stuff at work and with the people that we work with, we're going to then withhold it. And it's just taking up an enormous amount of emotional space on our emotional hard drive. And so to your point, if you can then, oh, it's safe to say that and we can get some love and support, right? That's what teams do for each other. That's what really healthy, strong environments create that we lift each other up when we need it. Yeah, and the crazy part is that, you know, just flipping it around just a little bit, we've also discovered that anytime that we're able to articulate love with boundaries, but articulate love with boundaries, anytime we're able to do that, Team members are willing to pick up and fight for you six months later, a year later. Like, for example, you know, with the with the whole COVID thing where I had to go to everybody. So, okay, all right, here's the here's the here's the real deal, guys. Um, Nobody knows what's going to happen. As of right now, you know, one of my businesses is a large construction company. As of right now, we we're we're okay to work. Right. We got to take extra precautions. We're going to need everybody to dig in and help out and stuff like that. Here's our trip wires. So no one has to live in fear. Nobody has to be scared about losing their job. I've, I've been doing this for a long time. I've got money in the bank. It's intentionally for this specific type, type of situation. That's why we have a, a massive emergency fund. We have months of operating capital to get by until we figure out what's going to happen. So nobody's right. getting fired today. We are going to tighten our expenses. We are going to tighten our discretionary stuff. But we're all in this together. The reason I say that is because the people that bought in and believed it were the very same, the mouthpieces, the people who were the megaphone for us Right. Were the same people that we had helped a year earlier, two years earlier when they were going through a tough time. And they're like, sure. no, when he says it, he's serious. Yeah. We got to, we got to do this together. Absolutely. That's such a great story and example of people do that. You know, I remember back in 2009, 2010, as we were still coming on, you know, through the economic crisis, mm-hmm. I remember my very first meeting down at Google. Now, Google, you know, very successful tech company, even back then, they had about 15,000 employees, which was a lot. Right. But what I, you know, in general, but for, for the size of their brand and their company, even at that time, you know, but they were still hiring and doing a lot of really interesting things in the, in the height of when everybody was letting people go and really struggling. And I remember remarking at that meeting, I was like, wow, I'm interacting with so many companies in the tech world, big, small, small businesses, everybody is doom and gloom and fear and layoffs and cuts. Cause that's the world we were in. Remember 10, 12, 12 years ago. Yeah. And what what someone, one of the leaders at Google said to me was like, look, we're fortunate in that we've managed some things well, but we know that A, we got to still continue to grow in smart ways during this time. And we also know it's really important how we treat our employees right now, because right now, most of them are just happy to have a job. But when this thing turns yeah. around and it will, people are going to have options on where they can go and what they can do. And they're going to remember how we treated them. So it goes both ways. To your point, you help yeah. people out. They're more likely to be engaged and bought in. But also you treat people well. And when things get tough or people have other options, you know, now Google has 115, 120,000 employees and has continued to grow exponentially over the last 10 years for a lot of reasons and not that they don't have their issues, but I use that as an example. And again, for you and your businesses, it's like being able to really care about people and value people and give them space to show up and maybe, you know, give them a hand when they need it boundaries. Right. But that yeah, comes absolutely. back around, you know, and another yeah. thing around this, a big part of my work has focused for years on appreciation and Glassdoor found, there was a study that Glassdoor did a few years ago for people who left their jobs voluntarily. When, mm-hmm. then when they were asked, why did you leave? 
53% of people said I would have stayed longer if I felt more valued and more appreciated by my manager or by my company. Yeah. Yeah. So that's huge, you know, and again, it, we have to manage all of these things simultaneously, but caring about people, valuing people, yeah. listening to people with no agenda. It doesn't even necessarily have to mean praise. It means just caring about, right? Loving them hard, like my coach said, yeah. so you can push yeah. people hard. They're more likely to be open to that if they feel really loved and valued. Yeah. I mean, you know, it all goes back to, you know, we kind of open the show up with life truths, right? There's everything that we've discussed in a, in a roundabout way is, treating people how you want to be treated, especially if that person is looking you back in the mirror. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I think your work is so important and it's so timely, especially right now with everybody trying to reset and trying to, you know, grasp for new strings of hope and inspiration and stuff like that. I think it's so vital. I think that everybody should go out and get, you know, your new book. Mm. I think everybody should have it. I'm still waiting on my copy. We are all in this together. <laughs> and, it, and it's definitely, um, I, in the in the snippets I've been able to get my hands on while waiting for my book, you know I've I've learned I've already learned a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's also tons of content that you've already got all over YouTube and all over the internet, um, which people can can kind of connect with you. But yeah. for the meantime, what is the best way for the whole audience to connect with you moving forward and learn more? Um, obviously, go out and get the new book for sure. But on top of that, what else? How, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Oh, well, I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Um, and thanks for having me on the show. I mean, the best way to connect with me and learn about all the books and the work is at our website, which is mike-robbins.com. Very cool, man. Well, dude, I have appreciated it. I know we went a little over on time. Thanks for my, my technological giggles, but uh, I appreciate <laughs> the time and, and can't thank you enough for spending some time with us together together today. It's been a, it's been a true inspiration. It really well, thanks. has. Thanks for having me. All right, my friend, we take care. We'll see you soon. Sounds good. What can I tell you? Mike Robbins is an amazing leader. Make sure you check out his new book. We're all in this together. And in the meantime, check out this interview right here because I know it'll keep you moving. What I did was nothing spectacular. Getting in some cold water for two minutes was not that difficult, really. Yeah. Right? Walking through some mud was not that difficult.